Hi everyone, welcome to another YouTube series. In this series, we're gonna get to know C Sharp, its main concepts, and we'll illustrate them using useful examples. In this particular video, we're gonna see an overview of C Sharp, and we'll also write our first Hello World program. C Sharp is a popular and modern programming language developed by Microsoft and it was first introduced in the early 2000s as part of Microsoft's .NET framework. C Sharp is designed for building a wide range of software applications, including desktop applications, web applications, mobile apps, cloud-based services and games. Some key features and characteristics of C Sharp worth mentioning are the following. C Sharp is an object-oriented programming language, which means it supports the principles of encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. This allows developers to create modular and reusable code. C Sharp includes automatic memory management through garbage collection. This feature helps developers avoid memory leaks and manage memory efficiently. C Sharp has evolved over the years and includes many modern language features, such as support for asynchronous programming with async await, language integrated query for data manipulation, and more. While C Sharp was initially developed for Windows, Microsoft has since created tools like .NET Core and .NET 5 and later versions to enable cross platform development. This allows developers to build C Sharp applications that can run on Windows, Mac OS, and various Linux distributions. Visual Studio is the primary IDE for C Sharp development. It offers a powerful set of tools for coding, debugging, and designing user interfaces. Just go to visualstudio.microsoft.com, there you can install Visual Studio. You can just scroll a bit down and click here on download Visual Studio and you can select this community here version here, which is the free version. Uh, that's how you download it. I have already downloaded it and installed it, but it's a pretty straightforward process, which I'm not going to do in this video. But I'm just opening up Visual Studio and I'm going to need to create a new project here. And as a template, I'm going to select the console application here. And I'm going to leave the rest as default. Uh, the name, I'm leaving it as it is, the name of the project. And also the version here, .NET 7. I'm going to create the project now. But as I was saying console application is this uh, basically this application that takes input and displays output at the command line console which you will see in a bit so this is the project that was created by default and here we can see this line in this file this console that the right line hello world console that the right line prints out this message hello world to the to the terminal and if we run the application here on top if we select run without debugging we should see the terminal pop up with the message hello world A variable is a way to store data in the computer's memory to be used later in the program. C Sharp is a type safe language, meaning that when variables are declared, it is necessary to define their data type. A data type specifies the size and type of variable values. We will start and see the most common data types one by one by starting with integers. To declare a variable, firstly we write the data type, then we give a name to it, and then we give it a value with the equal sign. Integer types store whole numbers, positive or negative, without decimals. As you can see on the screen, the size of an integer is 4 bytes, and you can also see the range of numbers that can be stored in them. So, basically, from the smallest negative number that can be written with 4 bytes, to the biggest positive number that can be written with 4 bytes. We can print this value to the console using console.writeLine, and then inside the brackets, we write the name of the variable that we created. 
If we just run the application here, we'll see the value of the variable in the terminal. Next, we have the long data type, which is usually used when int is not large enough to store the value. So we can create a long variable, just give it a name, and we'll put there a big number and make sure it should end with an L. The float and double data types can store fractional numbers. Note that you should end the value with an F for floats and D for doubles. The difference between them is that the precision of float is only 6 or 7 decimal digits, while double variables have a precision of about 15 digits. Therefore, it is safer to use double for most calculations. A boolean data type is declared with a bool keyword and can only take the values true or false. Then there is the char data type which is used to store a single character. The character value must be surrounded by single quotes and its size is 2 bytes. The string data type then is used to store a sequence of characters. The string value must be surrounded by double quotes and it takes a space of 2 bytes per character. Operators are used to perform operations on variables and values. The main operators in C -sharp are arithmetic operators, assignment operators, comparison operators and logical operators. Arithmetic operators are used to perform common mathematical operations. There are two types of mathematical operators, unary and binary. Unary operators perform an action with a single operand, while uh, binary operators perform actions with two operands. We're, we're going to start here with the binary operators. So firstly, let me just create a variable here, declare a variable here. So it's an integer variable, I'm naming it x and I'm giving it the value of 5. But we could also just write the type of the variable and the name of it in the first line and then give it a value underneath. So I'm just removing this here and I'm giving it a value underneath by using the binary operators. So I'm giving the to the x the value of 5 plus 3 which should actually result, result in 8. Let me just print the value of x to the console, run it here and we'll see the value of x to be 8. And the same thing we can do with all of the other binary operators like uh, division, uh, like subtraction, division, uh, multiplication with this sign here, so 5 times 3 should be 15. And we can also use the modulo operator, which basically just gives us the remainder when we divide 5 with 3. So 5 modulo 3 would result uh, actually in 2. Okay, so we can see it here. If we make, for example, mod 5 modulo 5, uh, it's 0 because there's no remainder. We can also check here the unary operators, which are the decrement operator and the increment op operator. So I'm giving to the x the value of 5 firstly, and then I'm gonna increase its value by 1 with this increment operator with two pluses. And we can see that the value of x was 6. And we can try now the decrement operator, which will decrease the value of 5 to 4. And we can use this in front or so before or after the x and it would it wouldn't make a difference actually as you can see now we'll see the assignment operators which are operators that are used to assign values to variables we have seen this when we give the x, when we declare a variable and we give the x the value of 5, but there are also other assignment operators, which we will see. So this plus equal operator, for example, would just add to the x the value of 6. And the same thing goes for other operators that we saw before. So minus equals will 
subtract from 5, 6. We can do division equal, multiply equal, or also modulo equal, which will just, uh, for example, do the modulo of 5 with 6, which is 5. Now we'll see the comparison operators, which are used to compare two values or variables. And uh, the return value of a comparison is either true or false, which we will see with examples now. So let me just firstly have another variable to test these comparison operators. So naming it Y. And here in the brackets, when we printed message to the console will use the to the equal operator which returns false in this case because x is different than 6 and if we do this if we try to compare x with y it would be false again here we can also try the greater than operator which returns true in case x is greater than y and in this case this is also false we have the less than operator. We also have less than or equal to, which returns true if x is either equal to y or less than y or smaller than y. We have greater than, equal or equal to also. And we can also try here the not equal to operator. So in this case, x is not equal to 6. That's why this uh, expression here gives us true. We can try it here with different values, actually. What we will see now is we will see the logical operators, which are used to determine the logic between variables or values. You can just give another uh, value to y. And here we'll try some expressions to test our logical operators. So the logical and returns true when both expressions on the left and on the right are true. So both, so if x is, equal, uh, is greater than 5 and y in this case is equal to 2, it will return true. But in as it is the case, if only one of them is true, then this whole expression will return false. Then the logic, we have also the logical or, which actually returns true in case only one of the statements on the left or on the right is true. So in this case, y is equal to 2, that's why this expression returns true. And the other logical operator is the logical not, which reverses the value of the expression. So if an expression is true, it makes it false. And if the expression is false, it makes it true. So y is actually equal to 2. That's why in this case, the value will be false. While doing different projects, you'll see that you will need to format and change the way the output is displayed to the user. So in this video, we'll see some main ways to format strings like uh, character escape sequences, string concatenation, and string interpolation. An escape character sequence is basically an instruction that will affect the output of your string. In C Sharp, the escape character sequence usually begins with a backslash and we'll see some different examples here. So as usual, we'll print a message, a string message to the console with this console.writeLine method. And here inside the string, we'll use the, okay, I'm writing a message firstly, like hello YouTube. And here we'll use a character escape sequence, which is the uh, backslash n, which basically just inputs a new line after the hello uh, word there. So hello and YouTube should be displayed in two separate lines, as we can see here. 
We would also use the backslash T, which just inputs a tab there. A tab is just like four spaces of, uh, just like four spaces. But what if we would want to write uh, double quotation marks inside the string? Well, usually the double quotation marks mark the be beginning and the end of a string. But if we would try to run the project, the program here, it would give us actually a syntax error, as we can see here. So what we would do in this case, if we write the backslashes before the two double quotation marks, this would actually display the word that we need inside uh, double quotation marks. So basically this way the program just ignores these uh, double quotation marks and just prints them as they are. But we will see another example here. For example, if we want to print the address of a file and we would need to actually output these uh, backslashes to the console. If we try it just like this, this would give us an error. If we try here to run the program, yeah, we can see here unrecognized escape sequence. So what we would need to do here is if we write two uh, backslashes, this would actually just display a single backslash. So if we try to run the project here, we would see our string with single backslashes. Another concept we will see now is the verbatim string literal. A verbatim string literal will keep all white spaces and characters without the need to escape the backslash. So if before the string we write the at sign, this is a verbatim string literal which just prints everything as it is written. So it doesn't escape the backslash, the spaces are as they are written inside the string. This we can see here. Everything is displayed just like we write it. Now we'll see the string concatenation, which is simply just combining two or more string values into a new string value using the plus operator. So firstly, I'm gonna need here two string variables. So I'm naming it var1, variable one. I'm just writing some text. And below, another variable as well variable two, just writing there, I don't know, again, YouTube. That's all my creativity for the day. Um, and here in the third variable, we want to print those two variables both. So in a message variable, I'm printing variable one plus variable two, and I can also add just manually a string there. So this exclamation mark, for example, here inside the string. And if we try to display this message to the console with the console.writeline uh, message, let me just around the project here, and we'll see hello YouTube there. So these two variables are combined in one together with the uh, exclamation mark. If we add a space there to the hello, they will be printed as we want it to be printed. But actually, usually we should, we could also write this entire thing inside the console.writeline method. So we actually didn't need the message variable. It's good to just like remove the additional variables if they are not needed, these intermediate variables. So we can use, we can write the variable one plus variable two plus exclamation mark just in the console.writeline method. So what we're going to see now is we'll see the string interpolation, which just inputs values of variables into a string. So these variables are written inside curly braces and the string has to begin with a dollar sign. So here we'll write the values of variable one and variable two and just some random text in the middle or in the end, whenever we want, wherever we want. But this string here has to begin with a dollar sign. So this is string interpolation. If we try to run the project here, 
we'll see that the values of those variables are displayed in the console. Another thing we could do is we could combine together the string interpolation with the verbatim string literal. So here if we write after the dollar sign the at sign, here inside if we for example wanted to display the uh, backslashes and we would like to also have like uh, the address of the file for example, we wanted to put it as a variable there. We can try here and write inside the curly braces the variable 1 and variable 2. So the interpolation helps us put their uh, variables inside the string and the verbatim string literal helps us to display to the console these backslashes or everything just as they are written. So the spaces and all. And as we can see, everything is displayed to the console as we wrote it. Typecasting is the process of converting a value from one data type to another. Typecasting enables us to work with variables of different types and it is also helpful when we want to ensure that some specific data is in the correct format for a particular operation. In this video, we will see implicit casting, explicit casting and casting using some built-in methods. Implicit casting converts a smaller size type to a larger size type. Let's say, for example, we can take an integer, which is 4 bytes, and convert it to a double, which is 8 bytes. Let me just firstly take an integer variable here. I'm giving it a name, like my int and a value of 9, for example. And and in order for me to convert this integer into a double, I just need to assign to a double variable the value of the integer by just writing the name of the uh, integer variable here. So this is how implicit casting is done. If I print now in the console the value of the double variable, it should be equal to 9, just like the integer variable. And explicit casting happens when you convert a larger size type to a smaller size type. For example, if we convert a double to an integer. So first let me just declare a double variable here. And I'm giving it a value of, let's say, 8.65. Don't forget the D at the end. And in order to convert this double into an integer, before assigning it, I just need to write in front, in front of it, in parentheses, the data type, which in this case is an integer. So this way we convert the double variable to an integer. And if I print to the console the value of the integer variable, we'll see that the value is 8. This happens because in explicit casting, the value of the double is truncated, or so to say, the part after the decimal is totally ignored, and in the integer is stored only the number 8. There is also another way to convert values from one data type to another, and this is done by some built-in methods. These methods are part of the convert class, and we will see later on what classes and methods are, but right now we just need to know what we use them for. For example, here, if in order to convert this double to an integer, I need this convert that to in 32. 32 just shows us the size of an integer in bits. And inside the parentheses, I'm taking there the value of my double. And if I print the value to the console, this we see here that the value of the integer is 9. This happens because the difference of these convert methods with the explicit casting is that they don't ignore the part of the decimal but they round the value of the double and this results in the integer to be 9. 
If we try here and change the double to 8.45, we'll see that the value would be 8 now, which would be around it again. So this is the difference of this convert methods to the explicit casting. With methods of this convert class, we have different methods to convert data types, such as convert that to int 64, which converts values to a long. An integer with 64 bits is basically a long. We can convert values to a double, to a string, or to booleans. When coding different projects, you will see the need to apply decision-making logic to them. For example, you would want to print specific message to the user or perform some action when a certain condition is met. In c -sharp, we use conditional statements for this purpose, and this is what we will see in this tutorial. So, firstly, we will see the if statement, which specifies a block of code to be executed if a certain condition is met. And we firstly need to write this if keyword here and inside parentheses we write an expression which should return either false or true and inside curly braces we write the block of code that we need to be executed in case the condition is met is true so uh, to illustrate this i'm just taking an integer variable naming it age and storing a value there of 18 and inside the parentheses, I'm writing an expression with this uh, smaller than, a less than operator. So if the age is less than 18, we want uh, to print out to the console a certain message like, I don't know, you are a kid or something. And if I run the project, the age is actually not uh, smaller than 18, not less than 18, so it should print out nothing, basically. Okay, as we can see it here, but now we'll see the else statement, which specifies a block of code to be executed if the condition is not met, or the condition is false. So inside the curly braces here, and after the else keyword, we write the block of code here, that we want to be executed. So I'm just writing here console data right line and I'm printing out to the console like if you're not younger than 18 you're an adult. So the program firstly checks the first condition and if it's that's not met it goes to this else clause and as we can see on the screen it's printed out you are an adult. After the first condition, after the if statement, we can write an else if statement, which specifies a new condition if the first condition was not met. After the first condition was false, the program goes and reads these second conditions that we write here inside parentheses after the else if keyword. So I'm just writing here something like if age is bigger than, let's say, 65, we want a certain message to be printed out. So I'm writing the code here inside curly braces, and I'm just writing console data right line. And just like a message, I don't know, you are old. If we try and run the project here, the age is actually 18, so it's still printed out you are an adult because the first condition is not met, the second one either, and it goes to this else statement. And if we make it 65 the age, it should still print you are an adult, but if the age would be uh, greater than 65, if the age is 66, you should see that the message you are old. This way that we are using here actually is not so convenient with me changing the value of the integer. And what we can do in this case, we can use a more interactive way so that the user can input data using the terminal. And this is done by this console.readline method. The one problem actually is that this method returns a string, which in our case, if we see the error here, 
cannot implicitly convert type string to int because we are storing it inside an integer variable of age. And for us to change it to convert, we have learned typecasting in the previous video and we can convert the value of this method to an integer with this convert to int 32 method when we input the number to the console it will be converted from a string actually to an integer and then it will be stored to this h variable i'm just writing a, a message to the console firstly to tell the user to enter the name just like to make it more user friendly So if I run the project here, we'll see that we have the option to input data in there. So I'm inputting an H and if I hit enter, we see that it is printed out. You are a kid. If we run the project again and try another age, yeah, 60, 76, you are old. What we will see now is we will see the switch statement. The switch statement we use to select one of many blocks to be executed. So we write this switch keyword and inside parentheses we write an expression and a variable or an expression and then inside curly braces we open the curly braces and there we specify multiple cases. The value of the expression is compared with the values of each case and if there is a match the associated block of code would be executed so in our here let me just write what we wrote above so if the in case the expression or this age is uh, less than 18 we write there semicolon and we copy this message from above this console data right line you are a kid to be executed and after we, this code is executed, actually we need to write the break keyword afterwards. The break keyword just basically means that just breaks out of the switch statement. So if the first case is true or is a match, then the program doesn't need to read all of the other cases, but it just breaks out of the loop. It just breaks out of the switch statement with this break keyword here. And down below, we'll write the second case if the age is bigger than 65. So I just write case. In case it is the age is bigger than 65. So we just write bigger than, greater than 65 since the age is specified inside the parentheses. And we write colon and we just write this message to the console and don't forget the break keyword and lastly we will write uh, so as we saw above this else statement we have a, a similar one here so in case none of the cases above is met we write this uh, this default key keyword here and here we specify what we want to be executed by default so if none of the cases above were met or were true and we write the break keyword again to break out of the switch statement and all of this switch statement here this code should be equal to what we wrote above the functionality should be the same so let me just delete it firstly and just try to run the project and to try how it works so if i enter the age of 43 tells me I'm an adult, as it should, according to what we wrote. If I run the project again and write 66, it tells me that I am old. Arrays are a fundamental data structure in C-sharp and they are used to store and manipulate collections of data. An array is basically a collection of elements of the same data types that are stored together. To declare an array, firstly we need to write the name of the data type and then we need to write square brackets and the name of the array. That's the declaration part and to give it a value 
or to initialize it, we write the equals sign. There are multiple ways, but first we need we will see this one. So we write the new keyword, the data type again, and inside the square brackets, we write the size of the array, which is fixed. Every array has a fixed size that we specify in the beginning. And what this new keyword does is that the new keyword creates a new instance of an array in the computer's memory that in this case can hold three strings. Now to access each element of this array, we need to write the name of the array and inside square brackets, we write, we access them by the indexes. Arrays begin with the index of zero. So the first element of the array is in the zero position and here we give it a value, a string value like John. And then to access the second element of the array, we go to the index number one, and which is equal to, we give it a value like a string, another string, like max, a name, name of a student. And that we can do now also for the third student, because this array has only three elements. So beginning from zero, and we give it the name of Paul. And if we would actually try to give a value to another student, to a fourth student, the program would give us an error because the array has only three elements. I try and run the project here. We can see that the index was outside the bounds of the array on line seven. And that's basically the error. So to print out these elements of the array, we write the console.writeLine method. And we can use string interpolation, which we saw a couple of videos back. So we write the dollar sign. And then inside double quotation marks, we write like some text, like the first student. And inside curly braces, we take the first student by writing the name of the array and inside square brackets, the index of zero. And that we can do for all of the three elements of this array. So I'm just copying this. I'm doing the same for the second and the third student. So like, let me just write here second student and change the index to one. Then the third student and change the index to two. If I print this out, there we see first student John, second student Max, and third student is Paul. What we'll see now is another way to initialize the array. There are multiple ways, but basically you just need to know them. You can use whatever you want, but you, can, you just need to know them. So when you see it, you can recognize them. So I'm deleting that part here and to give a value to the array, we can just write in the same line Inside curly braces, we can write the name of the strings separated by a comma, so like John, Peter, and I don't know what the other name was, Max, and this is valid, actually. This is one way to do it, but we could we'd also delete the first part here. That's not necessary. So just by writing the values of the strings inside the curly braces, that's how we give value to the elements of the array. We see that it works just like just the same way. Another way would be for us to just declare the array in the first line just like that. And then we can just initialize it down below. So student by writing students, the name equals to this new keyword, string, name of the data type, inside curly uh, square brackets, the size of the array and then inside curly braces we can write again the we can give value to the elements of the array so like john peter and max if i run the project here you will see that it still works so there are different ways to declaring 
and initializing arrays, but you just need to, you can just use one of them, whichever you want, but you need to recognize it when you see it on somebody else's code, for example. And here we will see to how to reassign a value of an array. So if, for example, for the first element, we give a value above to it, like John, we can reassign it by just taking, accessing that element, so students in the index of zero, and giving it a value of like, we'll give it a, a surname as well, so John Baker. If I run the project here, the name was reassigned, so to say. So the, the first element of the array, we gave it another name. The same things when creating arrays works also for other data types. Let me just make a, a short example here. So if the array would be of a, an integer array, just need to write here int, give it another name like my numbers. It would work just the same way. And to give it, to initialize it here with my numbers equals new integer array with three places. And the values of the integers of the elements will just, won't be inside double quotation marks, but just like numbers, just like integers. I'm changing it here also, the way we access the elements of this array. So my numbers in the index of one and my numbers in the index of two. I'm just changing the text here that it shows when you display the elements of this array. If I run the project here, we see the first number is one, second is three, third number is five. So it works just the same way. Loops are used to execute a block of code as long as the specified condition is reached. We'll see how both of these loops work and the difference between them so that we know when to use each one of them. So we'll start with a while loop. The while loop loops through a block of code as long as a specified condition is true. So we can just write while and inside parentheses we write the condition, which is a boolean expression that returns either true or false. And then the block of code will be written inside of the inside curly braces. To give an example, I'm just taking a variable, an integer variable, I'm giving it a value of zero, and I can int i variable equal to zero. i is actually an abbreviation for the index in programming, but it doesn't really matter what, uh, how you name the variable. And then let's make the condition to be true when let's say the variable is less than 11. And then inside the uh, curly braces, we want to print out to the console with this console.writeLine method, the value of the variable. And in the end of the iteration, we want to increment this value, the value of the variable by one by using the increment operator. So just by writing i plus plus So how this works is that in the first iteration the value of the variable is zero. So the condition is true and because of this the value of the variable will be printed out to the console. And then in the end the value of it will be incremented by one. In the second iteration, the value of the variable is 1, so the condition is again true, and the block of code will be executed again. This will happen until the value of the variable will get to 11. In this case, the condition will be false, so the program will just skip the loop. If we just run the program here, we should see a list of numbers from 0 to 10, which is basically what this code that we wrote here does. When we write a while loop, we should always make sure that its condition will be false at some point. Otherwise, if the condition of the loop is always true, the program would run the block of code forever and this would result in an infinite loop, which we do not want. So in our loop here, if we didn't increment the value of the variable after each iteration, its value would always be zero 
and the program would run the value of zero over and over again. As we can see here, the program would run the zero value just like over and over again, the value of the variable. And this is an infinite loop. Infinite loops would just cause our program to crash at some point, and we do not want that. To avoid it, we should either take care of the logic of the loop, or we could also use the if statement so that when a certain condition is met, we want the program to just break out of the loop. Let me just change the logic here of our loop a bit so that we can make use of this if statement. So let's say we want to run this code as long as the variable i is greater than or equal to zero. So just let me just remove this. Just greater than or equal to zero. And in this case, this would actually be an infinite loop since we would just increment the value of the variable after each iteration and the condition would always just be true. And to stop this, we can just make an if statement so that when the variable reaches a certain value, just like, let's say, 15, we want the program to break out of the loop by just writing inside curly braces this break keyword, which we also saw when we saw the switch statements. This just makes the program to break out of the loop. And if we run the project here, we'll see a list of numbers from 0 to 15. When the variable reaches 15, the program will just break out of the loop. And what we'll see now is we'll see the do while loop. The do while loop is just like a variation of the while loop. But what it does is that the program just executes the block of code firstly, and then it reads the condition. So I'm just writing here the same logic of the while loop that we did before. So I'm just printing out to the console the variable value, and then I'm incrementing its value. And underneath, we write the condition. So while the variable is less than 11, let's make it again so. And in this case, we would still see the same result. We would see, still see a list of numbers from 0 to 15, from 0 to 10. But in other cases, for example, if we want the condition to be true when the integer is greater than 5, even though the condition is false in this case, the program would still just run the block of code once. And then when it checks that the condition is false, it will just like skip the loop. So we should use the do while loop instead of the while loop in those cases when we want to execute the block of code at least once, no matter of the condition. The for loop iterates through a block of code for a specific number of times. And this level of control makes the for loop different from the other iteration loops. We will see its structure in this video, how to use it, and of course, a few examples. Firstly, we write the for keyword, and then inside parentheses, we write three, there are three different parts separated by a semicolon. Firstly, we initialize the iterator variable that we're going to use for this loop. Here I'm taking an integer variable, giving it i, and giving it an initial value of zero. And after this, we write the condition. As long as this condition is true, the block of code that we will write below would be repeated on a loop. And in the end, we write the iterator, which basically determines what will happen after each iteration. Here, we're incrementing the value of i by one. And inside the curly braces, is written the block of code that should be repeated on a loop. Let's say, for example, we will print out for each iteration with this console.write line the value of this i variable. We should be able to see a list of numbers from 0 to 9. When the variable is 10, the condition will no longer be true and the program will skip the loop. We can actually play around here with the conditions and the iterator. We can also decrement the value of the i variable after each iteration. And let me just here say here, we'll start by a value of 10. 
and the condition will be true as long as the number is as long as the variable is greater than or equal to zero. So this basically is the reversed thing. We'll see a list of numbers from 10 to zero. And would also decrement the value of i after each iteration by more than one, by like let's say by three, by writing this minus equal operator that we have learned. So i e minus equal three. We'll see then printed out ten, then seven, then four, and then the number one. Many different mathematical problems can be solved with the for loop. Let's say, for example, we want some specific information from a list of 100 numbers. Let's say I'm taking here, I'm changing this again. So I'm taking numbers from 0 to 100 and I'm incrementing the value of i after each iteration. And let's say, for example, we can use an if statement inside the for loop to get some specific information. So let's say if we want numbers that can be divided by four, we can write here i modulo four equals to zero. So if this condition is true, then the number can be divided with no rest. And we'll just like set the curly braces. We can print out of the console these numbers and I'm just starting from one, so zero does not count, so that the zero won't count. And we here have numbers from four, eight, 12, until 100, all the numbers that can be divided with four. Another important use of the for loop is that we can use it to iterate through the elements of an array. So let me just have an array here of characters. I'm writing here char and this square brackets, I name it grades, and I'm giving here values to the elements of the array. So I'm just inside single quotation marks, I'm writing the grades, A, B, C, until F. And for us to iterate through each element of this array, I'm using a for loop, I'm starting from um, from the value of zero, I'm initializing here the i variable, the initial value will be zero. And for us to loop through each element of the array, I'm going to need to make the condition true as long as i is less than the length of the array. We can take the length of the array by using grades.length. That length is a method that we can use with each array which we'll learn later what methods are actually, but just for now we need to know what it does. So this loop will be true as long as i is less than 6 in our case. And after each iteration we'll increment the value of i. So to get access to each element of the array, let me just print out the console. We'll access the element of the array by writing the name, grades, and then inside square brackets, the position of the element at the array. So in the first iteration, we'll be printed out the element in the zero with the index of zero. And then in the second one, the element with the index one and so on until the last element of the array. If I run the project here, we'll see a list of all of the elements of this array. We would also use this for loop to manipulate data inside the array by just accessing the array the elements of the arrays, just like we did here, but this was just an example. In the previous video, we saw the for loop in C sharp and how we could iterate the elements of an array with it, which we can see in this code here as well. But there's also another loop used exclusively to loop through elements of an array, and this is the for each loop. This is what we'll see in this video, how the for each loop works, but we'll also see the limitation that it has when compared to the for loop. The for each loop provides a simple and a clean way to loop through the elements of an array. Firstly, I'm just going to comment this for loop here out by just writing control plus K plus C in the keyboard at the same time, so that we just have it in the background as a reference. And underneath, we are going to start to write the for each loop. Firstly, we just need to write the for each keyword. 
And then inside parentheses, we need to specify a temporary variable, which will have the type of the elements of the array, which is chars in this case. We will give a name to this temporary variable, and then we add the in keyword, and then the name of the array that we are looping through. Basically, this temporary variable holds the value of the element associated with the current iteration. In the first iteration, the grade variable holds the value of the first element of the array, or the value of the letter A in our case, and so on. And what this for each loop does is that it takes each element of the array, starting from the first one, and then in increasing order, and for each one of them, it executes the block of code that we will write below. So here inside curly braces, we would we'll write this console.writeLine method and we'll print out to the console each element of the array by just writing grade, this temporary variable grade there. And what this code will do is we'll do the same thing as the for loop did before. So it will print out to the console each element of our array. We will do different things with the for each loop. I'm just taking an integer array below so that we will do some different things with integers. I'm just taking an integer array, naming it my numbers. And I'm giving some value to the elements of this array. So like 30, 55, 66, I don't know, 78. And I'm going to need also another variable here down below, an integer variable. I'm naming it sum and I'm giving it a value of zero at first. Then we'll write the for each loop here. I'm going to declare a temporary variable of integers, which is the type of the elements of the array. I'm naming it number, this in keyword, and the name of the array that we're looping through. So inside curly braces here, for each after, in each iteration, I want to add to the sum variable the value of the current element of the array by writing here this number variable. So at the end, the sum variable will have the sum of all of the elements of our array. And after the loop ends here, I'm just going to need to print out of the console this sum variable so that we will see what value it will have. If I run the program here, here at the end we see 200, 200, uh, 229, which is the sum of all of these elements. Just delete this part here and what we see now is we will see the difference between the for each loop and the for loop or the one limitation that the for each loop has. If you would want, for example, to assign a value in this array of elements inside the for each loop, I'm just using here an if statement, so in case the element, this grade variable is equal to, let's say, A, the letter A, side curly braces here, we can reassign it, which we'll try to reassign this grade, this element of the array, with another letter that we haven't used before, let's say Z, and we see that there's an error there. If I run the program, we'll also see the error here, so cannot assign to grade because it is a for each iteration variable. And this is actually for each for, for every for each loop, we cannot reassign or modify the elements of that array inside the for each loop. But what would, would happen if we would try to do this inside the for loop above? I'm just uncommenting this out by right by clicking control plus K plus U in the keyboard at the same time. And here I'm just gonna try to copy this code here. Inside the for loop, I'm just going to need to change the name or access the elements of the array by just writing here grades, the name of the array, and we'll access the elements of it by writing uh, square brackets and this i variable, this index of the elements. And inside the for each loop below, I'm just going to need, I'm just going to use it to print out the console the grades, each element of the array by just writing a sold at right line grade. So the first loop would just resign the value to of a to z and the second loop, the for each loop, will just print out to the console each element of the array. And as we can see here, 
the elements of the array are printed out to the console and Z is a, the A element, the first element is reassigned to Z. So these two loops are very similar with each other. In some cases, the for each loop is the better choice since the code is cleaner and shorter, but depending on each case, as you saw here, you should use the for loop if you want to modify the content of the array. A method is just a unit of code designed to perform a specific task. Methods are also called functions and they are a key part of keeping the code structured, efficient and readable. So firstly, when writing a method, we need to start by writing the method signature. The method signature starts by writing the return value of the method. Void is the return value when the method doesn't return a specific data. So the method may print something out of the console or do some specific task, but it will not return a specific data type. And then we write the name of the method, which basically tells us what the method does. In C Sharp, the name of the method is written using Pascal case. Pascal case is this naming convention where the first letter of each compound word is capitalized. If we were using camel case, the first word would be in lowercase. And then we write the parentheses and inside curly braces, we write the definition of the method, which is basically what the method does. And in this case, I'm just writing something out. I'm just printing something out to the console with this console data write line method. Just something like hello, for example. And this is how we write the method. But if, if we would run the project here, we would not see anything printed out to the console. For a method to be executed, we need to call it. This we can do before or after we define the method. And how we do it is by just writing the method name and the parentheses. And of course, of course, after that, the semicolon. If I run the program now, we should see hello printed out of the console. Sometimes we may, the method may need to get some information into it. So we need to input some data in the method. And how we do it is by writing parameters in the method. So inside the parentheses, we define first the data type that the method needs to get, and then the like string, and then we give a name to it. Basically, just like variables. I'm just gonna use this variable here when we print the message out of the console by just writing plus here and the same variable and the value and the value of this parameter is specified by us when we call the method. Here inside this print name line here, inside the parentheses, we need to write a string and what this is called, this is called an argument. So the value we give for the parameter when we call the method, like Ben or something. And if I run the program here, we should see hello Ben in the console. A method can have multiple parameters. Let me just have an integer here as well. I'm naming it, I don't know, like age. And I will just change a bit what we print out of the console. So it's like a sentence, like name, plus a string like is, plus this age variable. And this, now we also need to specify an integer argument when we call the method. Some value like 21 or so. If I run the program here, we should see Ben is 21. What we'll see now is we'll see what default parameters are. So sometimes when we need to, we can give to a parameter a default value. Let's say, for example, we're handling here people of an age like 21. And we can give it the parameter here with an equal sign. We can give it a default value. So in this case, we do not have to specify the age variable when we call the method. We don't need this as an argument. And if I run the program now, we should see Ben is 21. So the age is by default 21. But if we would want to change the default value of it, we can just input here when we call the method another value. And the age now will have the value of 30. 
we can see we will see also now the named arguments when we call the method if we do not specify the arguments in the correct order it wouldn't work let's say we define first an int argument and then a string argument the order is not correct but if we do not want to remember it we can specify it manually here to which parameter it relates to with this key value pairs like age colon and then 30 and we can do the same thing for this other argument so the name of the variable colon and then the string so by using these named arguments we don't have to memorize which parameters comes first or second and we can just specify them manually there i'm just gonna delete this part here and until now as we saw we have only handled void methods that do not return a specific value but methods can return different values like integer double boolean or something or anything and we'll do this by writing int firstly in the method signature and then the name of the method I'm just having two integer parameters here. And inside the curly braces, let me just return, return x plus y. So this method returns an integer, which is the sum of the two parameters. If I would call the method here, this get sum and two integers if i run the program we shouldn't see anything actually in the console because this method only returns a value it doesn't print it out of the console and how you can see its value is uh, either by writing this get sum method inside the console.writeline method but usually for the code to be more readable we usually st store the value of the method inside another variable let me just delete this. I'm creating a result integer variable. And then I can simply just print out to the console this result variable. It's more easy on the eye and you understand what you are doing better. I'm going to delete this line here. So let me just define here a string method, which returns a string. I'm naming it getName. I'm just giving it a string parameter here of name. And I'm just making the method only to return this name. And for us to actually see what the method returns, I'm just creating a variable here to store what the method returns, like a string result variable. And we write here the method, we call the method here with this get name and we need a string as an argument, like Kim. If we just print out this variable now to the console, we should be able to only see this name, the string that the method returns. So these were the basics of methods in C Sharp, the main concepts and terms that you would need while working with them. Uh, we will also see methods later on as members of classes, but this was it for now. As we have talked about before in this series, C Sharp is an object-oriented programming language, which basically means that the data and behavior are organized in reusable data structures called objects. Today, we're gonna to talk about classes and objects, which are the two main aspects of object-oriented programming. In C Sharp, a class is a blueprint or template for creating objects. It defines the data and behavior of the object that will be created based on it. In simpler terms, a class is like a blueprint for a house, where the house represents an object, and the blueprint defines the structure and behavior of that house. So here I have just created a simple console application in a Visual Studio. Here you can see a program class with a main method inside of it. What this main method is, is the main method is the entry point of a console application. As soon as the program starts, this is the first method to be invoked. And we use this main method 
to we'll use this main method to actually create this is the place where we create the objects after we have created the class the main method is usually stored in a separate class or so to say in a specific class and we have we name it program by convention and actually let me just i will start this tutorial by creating firstly a class above it uh, to create a class we write firstly the class keyword and then we give a name to the class i'm naming it user and then inside curly braces we define the class a class has fields and methods what fields are just are like variables inside the class and what they do is they define the property and they, so to say they define the data or the property of the class let me just take an ex example here um, the first field i'm gonna have a name field I'm writing here public string and i'm giving it a name of name so what this public keyword here does is this is an access modifier that basically allows us to access this field of the user inside other classes and then i will actually make a specific video about access modifiers so that you won't get overwhelmed in this video but just so that you know what it does and then we write the uh, data type and a name for the field i'm actually going to go ahead and create another uh, field i'm naming uh, a string and i'm naming it username in pascal case that's how you write it and the, now i'm also going to create a method methods basically just define the behavior of a class we have i've also made a separate video about methods uh, just a couple videos before this i think i will link that down in the description but yeah, let me just create the method firstly i'm making it public so that it can be accessed outside this class just as i did for the fields and then we write the return type which i'm gonna set it to be void so that it doesn't return a specific data type and i'm giving it a name i'm naming it get user then parentheses and inside curly braces here i'm just gonna print out to the console Let me see. Okay, I'm gonna print out to the console this name and username fields. So like this string interpolation. This is how we access this the fields name and don't forget the semicolon here. So here we have created our class and down in the main method we can create objects which are instances of classes so to create an object firstly the syntax of it is firstly we write the name of the class and then we give a name to the object i'm naming it first user and then equal you write the new keyword user which is again the name of the class and then parentheses this is how you create an object and then to give to access the the fields and the methods of this object which it which it inherits from the class we just write here the name of the object dot let's say name the name of the field and we can give it a value here to it let's say sean and just the same way we can also access the second field the username okay this is first first user was the name of the object we can give a value to the username let's say sean.baker and la lastly what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna also invoke the method the get user method that this object inherits by just writing first user 
dot get user and then parentheses and what this will do is actually it will just print out to the console the name and the field of the name and the username of this object so if i run the program here we should actually see sean comma sean .baker. we can create as many objects as we want let me just create just copy this down i'm creating a no, second object i'm naming it second user Okay, I don't know why, what I did here. Then I'm giving it another name like John. User, and then here I'm accessing the username field. I'm making it like John.Baker the username and then I'm calling this method that this uh, that this second object inherits as well so if I run the program again we'll see for the two of our objects this method invoked so let me just go back to our code here and to our class more specifically we saw before class members that we have fields and methods and it's also important to know that there are two types of map class members we have instance members and static members instance members are those members that are accessible from an object as we saw in this example here we firstly needed to create an object and then we access the fields of the class and also the method but we also have static members static members are accessible by it the class itself let me just take an example here i'm just making a static method for us to do it after writing public here i need to write the static keyword i'm making the return type to be void i'm giving it a name i don't know i'm just printing out i'm just printing something out to the console so I'm just adding here print and here I write console dot right line and I'm just printing out this is a static method just like that and for me to access this method I don't need to access it by an object I can on, I only need to write the class name that and then the name of the method let me just put this at the end and if i run the program we should be able to see this is a static method uh, we can also have of course static fields let me just take an example of it so writing public static int age and i'm just giving it here value and we can access this value just by using the class name so by using user that h this is the way we access it and for us to see this in the console i'm just using this console that right line method if i run the program we should see 22 at the end we have actually seen static methods before so just here we can see console is a class the name of the class and a right line is the name of the method which is static because this is how we access this method by just using the class name usually static members are defined in those cases when something is singleton let's say in our console application there's only one console and for this reason there wouldn't be make sense for it to have for there to be different objects to tell you for example different ways of how you can print something out to the console for this reason the console class and all its methods or members are defined as static A constructor is like a special method that is used to initialize objects. A constructor is called when an object of a class is created 
and the reason we use it is to set initial values for fields. So here I have just opened up a console application in Visual Studio. I just have a user class here with three fields with the name, username and age field. I also have a program class with this main method where we're, also, where we're actually going to create the objects. So to actually write the constructor, we firstly need to just write the success modifier. I'm setting it to public so that the constructor will be accessible outside of the user class. And then uh, we need to write the name of the class. The constructor has to have the name of the class and it doesn't return anything like void or an integer or string. The, it, the constructor does not have a return type. After the name of the constructor here, we just write parentheses and then inside curly braces we can give an initial value to, to a field. Let me just give here to the name field a value of Jake and down below in this program class in the main method I'm just going to create a user object. I'm naming it user new user so here the constructor will be called and the name field will be given the value of Jake. Let me just print out to the console here with this console.writeLine method the value of the user object that name. We should be able to see Jake printed out to the console. Here we can see Jake. So even when we do not explicitly create the constructor, as soon as an object is created, the constructor is created by default. But if we do not create a constructor, we will not be able to set an initial value to the fields of the object. The constructors can actually take one or multiple parameters. Let me just, for example, here take a string parameter for the name, also a string parameter for the username and a string param and an integer parameter for the age. And down below, I'm just gonna give to the field, to the name field of the class, I'm gonna give the value of this name parameter. And also I'm gonna do the same thing for the username field and for the age field. And as soon as we create the object down below, we actually need to specify here, we see that we have an error here, we need to specify the parameters that the constructor has. So we need to specify a value here for the name. Let me just write it again, Jake here. We need to specify a value for the username, like Jake Baker. And also a value for the age. Let me just make it set it to 24. And this way, when the object is created, the constructor here is called, and it takes these three values and it sets the these values to this name, username, and the age field. We could actually just print out to the console the user that name, or we could also then just run the program here. We could also just do the same for the username and the age. Let me just run the program one more time. And we see here Jake, Jake Baker, and the age, which is 24. So let's say, for example, we didn't use a constructor. Let me just comment the constructor out here and also these lines of code here. The way to set the initial values of the fields of the object would be a bit different. So let me just create the same object here. And if I would want to give a value to each of its fields, I would actually would need to do this one by one. So use by setting to user that name a value like John and then the same thing for user that username like John Baker and then also I would need to set 
separately the value of the age setting it to 24 again and actually this way as you can see here it uses more lines of code but the most important thing is that it's not actually the recommended way it's more compact and more readable if we actually give the initial values of the fields of the object in the constructor and then we declare it here down below and this is actually the way you will see most while programming the way you will actually use the most In C Sharp, access modifiers are keywords used to specify the visibility or accessibility of types like classes, interfaces, and members such as fields, methods, and properties. In C Sharp, there are six access modifiers. The ones we will use the most are public, private, and protected, but we also have internal, protected internal, and private protected. The public keyword is an access modifier for types and type members. Public access is the most permissive access level. There are no restrictions on accessing public types or members. We can see in this code here that the public name field can be easily accessed inside another class. The private keyword is a member access modifier. Private access is the least permissive access level. All private members are accessible only within the body of the class in which they are declared. In this code here, we can see that the private name field is accessed inside the main method, which is possible only because this method is inside the same class where the field is declared. The protected keyword is a member access modifier. A protected member is accessible within its class and by derived class instances. We will see derived or child classes when we see inheritance, but basically this is a class that inherits from another class. The protected name field here is accessed inside the student class, which inherits from the user class. This colon symbol is the symbol used to make a class inherit from another one. With the internal access modifier, the type or member can be accessed by any code in the same assembly, but not from another assembly. An assembly is a .dll or .exe file created by compiling one or more CS files in a single compilation. So in other words, internal types or members can be accessed from code that is part of the same compilation. We can see in this example here that the uh, internal field can only be accessed inside the same assembly. The protected internal keyword combination is a member access modifier. A protected internal member can be accessed by any code in the assembly in which it is declared or from within a derived class in another assembly. The protected internal field in this example can be accessed inside the derived class in another assembly. The private protected keyword combination is a member access modifier. A private protected member is accessible by types derived from the containing class, but only within its containing assembly. The derived class in this example here can access the myValue field only because they belong to the same assembly. These were the six access modifiers in C-sharp. They are very important because they help in encapsulating and organizing the code, providing control over the visibility and accessibility of the data of our application. We saw in the previous video that private variables or fields can only be accessed within the same class. An outside class has no access to them. Well, sometimes we need to access them and this is why we use properties. So in this piece of code here, we can firstly see a private name field and just underneath we see a name property. A property is basically like a combination of a variable and a method and it has two methods, the get and the set method. A property is associated to a certain field, in this case to this above, to this name field above and they usually have, it's a good practice that the property and the field have the same name, but the properties should start with an uppercase uh, letter. 
and this uh, name property here we can see that it has a get method which makes it possible to get the name field outside of this class and this set method makes it possible to assign a value to this name field out still outside this class since we have here a private name field and just to see how this works let's just go down below to this program class to this main method let me just firstly create a user object which is the name of the class naming it object and then we can just by just writing object that name so by using this name property we can set a value to this we can set a value to the name field let me just write just a string here like Jake and underneath by using firstly the console console that write line method we can access we can see here how we can access the name the field by just writing object that name and if I run the program here we should see name present uh, the Jake printed out to the console so basically by using the name property we firstly here assign a value to this to the name field and underneath here we can access the name fields value there's also another way how we can just write all these lines of code and this is by using auto implemented properties let me just comment this out here and to use the auto implemented properties this is just basically like a shorter way how to write all this code where we do not need to specify the field here and we do not need to specify the methods so basically by just writing here public string name and then inside curly braces i'm just gonna need to write get and set and this basically does everything that these lines here do so uh, this is called an auto implemented property and the lines below just work the same way and we can just use we can access the name field by the same way and we can assign a new value to it just like we did before if i run the program here it should still work and there's also uh, we also have the option for example if we want the field to have to only be readable outside of the class we can just write the get keyword here so this name field is read only we can only get the, its value outside of the class but we cannot modify it if we can see here where we try to change the names value we see an error because the property is read only but we still have the option here to access the value of this private field so these were properties in c sharp they are important for the encapsulation of our application since they hide sensitive or certain data from the users inheritance is a fundamental concept in object-oriented programming that allows a class to inherit properties and behaviors from another class the class being inherited from is called the base class or the parent class and the class that inherits is called the derived class or the child class so in this example here we firstly have a person class with a couple of fields with the name and the last name field and with an introduced method that just prints out to the console this name and this last name if we would want to inherit from this class let me just make an example here I'm creating a user class and for it to inherit from the person class I'm just gonna write the colon symbol and then the name of the class so in this case person is the base class or the parent class and user is the derived class or the child class and the user class now we will inherit every field property or method so all of the class members that this person class that this base class has so let me just open up the curly braces here and i'm also going to add another field to this user class i could have added as many fields properties or methods as i wanted to here but i'm just gonna make this example with just an additional field i'm naming it username 
and now to test out how this actually works let me just create a user object down below in this class in this program class in this main method here so let me just create a user object naming it user new user and then this user object will actually have a name which it inherits from the person class I'm just naming it giving it a value of Jordan the object also has a last name giving it a value of like Parker and the username of course is the field defined in the user class then I'm giving it a value like Jordan underline Parker and for me to actually access also this introduced method that was inherited from the person class I can just write user dot introduce and then the parenthesis and now if I just run the application here, we should just see this introduce method get called and we see Jordan Parker, the name and the last name of our object. Let me just also print out to the console the username. We're just writing console.writeline and then user dot username. And we can see underneath here we see Jordan Parker which was the username that we gave to our user object. If we would want for example to have another class down below that I'm naming it admin and this actually would inherit from the user class. This class now would have all of the class members of the user class and then as a result also all of the class members all of the fields properties and methods of this person class and i think you understand how this then works so this was it for inheritance in c sharp inheritance is a powerful concept that enables code reusability and helps in creating a logical hierarchy of classes Polymorphism is one of the three fundamental principles of object-oriented programming after encapsulation and inheritance which we have seen so far. Polymorphism is a Greek word that means many forms and it occurs when we have many classes that are related to each other by inheritance. For example, an object of the programmer class is first of all a programmer, but it is also an employee and it is a person as well. So basically it has different forms. So in this piece of code here we have a base class, an employee class with just a simple introduce method that just prints this line out in the console and then we have three other classes that inherit the employee class. We have the programmer class, the doctor class and the lawyer class. As we saw in the previous video when we talked about inheritance, when a class inherits from another class it inherits all of its members. So in this case for example, when we create a programmer object, it would inherit this introduce method by default. Let me just demonstrate it real quick. So I have a programmer object here. And if I would call from this programmer object the introduce method, let me just run the program, we would see this line I'm an employee printed out to the console. But polymorphism allows us to override the class members of the base class in the uh, derived class. So if we would want to, we have the option to change a method or another class member to be different in each specific class. Let's say, for example, we would want in each of these classes the introduce method to print out to the console something more specific. And to do so, we need to just write the virtual keyword in the method in the base class so that we can overwrite it down below in the derived classes. Then here in the, derived, in the programmer class, let's say, if I'm just gonna 
want to override the same method i'm just going to write public and then the override keyword the return type and the name of the method should remain the same and i just need to print out to the console the different message so let's say i want to print out i am a programmer and i can actually do this for all of the other derived classes as well just i can just change it here i'm a doctor the message that we want to be shown up and in the last class let's say i am a lawyer so if i would actually just create an object for each of our classes here for the doctor class name it doctor equals to new doctor and then for the lawyer class I'm creating another object equals to new lawyer I can actually call the introduce method now for each of my of the objects that I created for the doctor object and for the lawyer object as well if i run the program we should now see the different message printed out to the console for each of the objects just remember that overwriting works with methods and properties by just writing the virtual keyword in the base class but it does not work with fields so abstraction is a fundamental concept in object-oriented programming abstraction involves creating abstract representations of real world objects emphasizing the essential features while hiding the non-essential details. In C-sharp, abstraction is achieved through the use of abstract classes, interfaces and abstract members, which we are going to see in this video. So firstly, I'm going to start with abstract classes. Abstract classes are classes that cannot be instantiated on their own and they can implement abstract methods or even concrete methods or basically normal methods that have a body in them. Let us just start creating an abstract class. So firstly we need to write the abstract keyword, then we write class and we give a name to this class like employee. Let me just open up the, the curly braces. And here in the body we can an abstract class can have fields let me just take an example string name it can also have properties like public string let's make the last name a property let me just write here the get and set keyword and yeah it's important to note that in the abstract classes we, as i said before we can have abstract methods which are methods where, where they are implemented on the class that inherits this abstract class but we also can have normal methods or concrete methods let me just write an abstract class in the beginning let's just say public abstract void and then i'm gonna write the name of the method like job title i'm gonna write the parentheses and then i'm not gonna write the body to this method just note that here i'm got i have written before we write the return type for the method i have written this abstract keyword and down below let me just write a concrete method or like a normal method like public void which is the return type and then I'm naming it introduce and in the inside the curly braces I'm just gonna print a line in the console console that the right line like I am an employee so and yes that was it so as we can see here we can we have the right to use access modifiers 
in the members of our abstract class if we wanted to we could make like the name as private protect it or whatever we wanted to do here as we have seen also in the previous videos how that how the access modifiers work but for now we can we are going to see how we can inherit an abstract class in another class so let me just write a programmer class and i'm going to inherit with the colon symbol the employee class and here this class needs to implement the abstract method if we want to use it so i'm just going to need to write public override i'm going to need to write the override keyword so that we can implement our job title method void is the return type and then job title and let me just write another line here so like console dot write line and i'm gonna want to print out to the console the line i am a programmer let's say so this programmer class inherits the name the last name property the name field this uh, job title method is implemented here and it also inherits the introduce method which we do not need to implement down below let me just go back to the program go here down below to the program class to this main method i'm just going to need to create a programmer object i'm naming it programmer new programmer i'm gonna see that we can use with this programmer object both of the methods so the job title method and the introduce method and let me just run the program and you can see firstly I am a programmer and then I am an employee so now let's just see how interfaces work let me just create an interface firstly by creating an interface i'm just going to need to write the interface keyword and then uh, usually we can give a name to the interface and it usually is begins with an i let me just give it the name of employer let's say to open up the curly braces so an interface is a completely abstract type and we can only implement we can only write method signatures in an interface we cannot implement them here we can have we cannot have also fields but we can have only properties and methods if i would want to like create a field like a string name it would give me an error because interfaces cannot contain fields and we also cannot use the access modifiers that we could use in the abstract method above so we cannot write every member of the interface is by default public and we cannot make it let's say private protected or we cannot put any other access modifier there so let me just write make it a property not a field we'll see that we won't get an error anymore and we don't need this semicolon at the end and we can write as i said before we cannot implement methods here but we can only write method signatures a method signature is written only by writing the return type let's say void and then let's write introduce here the name of the method the parenthesis and that's it we're gonna need to implement this method in the class that inherits the interface if I would want to make it private, let's say the method, it would give us an error because as I said, every member of an interface is by default public. So let me just remove this here. And for us to implement, to, to inherit this interface, let me just create another class. Let's say manager to inherit 
the interface I employer and here I'm gonna to need to specify to write again the uh, property so I'm just gonna make it public here since we are in a class not an interface I'm gonna make the property to be visible and I'm gonna also write the implement the method I'm making it public introduce and here we're going to define a body for this introduce method so i'm just printing out to the console the console with console that write line method i am an employer if i going down to the program class to the main method let me just create an object for the manager like manager and get manager equals to new manager here i'm calling the introduce method if i run the program let me just see what error I did. Okay, this should be a semicolon. We should see at the end, I am an employer. And we saw the differences that there are between an interface and an abstract class. But another difference is that a class can inherit only one abstract class. So it's not possible to inherit more than one, but the class can inherit multiple interfaces. Let's say if we had another interface here, I'm just going to create one just as an example. I'm going to give it another name. I second interface. I know it's a name there. I'm going to delete this here in the manager class. We saw that it inherited the I employer interface, but by writing like a comma, and then the name of the second interface, this class now has the possibility to inherit more than one uh, interface. And that's also one of the difference between the interface and an abstract class. In C Sharp, a list is a data structure which stores collections of data. We have seen before a similar data structure, which were arrays, and the list is similar to an array, except for the fact that it can grow or shrink dynamically in size. For this reason, lists are more versatile and widely used in C Sharp. They provide a variety of methods to work with their elements, and this is what we will see in this video. So when we talked about arrays, we saw that this is a syntax, how we can create an array. Here we have the data type of the elements of the array, then the square brackets. This is here we write the name of the array, and then we write the new keyword, the data type again, and then inside the square brackets, here we define the size of the array, meaning that this array can contain only three items. And here's a way we can access those elements. Here we are giving to each element a value to the first element, to the second element, and to the third element. And let me just print out the elements of the array to the console by using a for each loop. So for each parentheses here, I'm going to take a variable of a string variable, naming it item in items. So basically what this is doing is just looping through each item in this items array and open opening up the curly braces and I will print out to console each item. So let me just run the program here. And here we have all of the elements of our array. So the syntax actually to create a list is a bit different. Let me just comment this out firstly. So to create a list, firstly, we need to write the list keyword. Then uh, inside this angle brackets here, we write data type or the type of the elements that this list will contain. So let me just create a list of strings 
I'm naming it uh, languages and then here I'm gonna write the new keyword list we're creating a new list again here we will specify the data type of the elements of the of the list and here I'm just writing the parentheses so basically yeah, this is the syntax of how we can create a list and as you can see we do not specify the size of the list as we did with the arrays and actually to add elements to this list there is we need to write languages or the name of the list and this there is an a uh, built-in method that we can use for lists which is add and this method basically just allows us to add elements so i'm adding a string element i'm giving it a value of uh, let's say python so basically this line here substitutes the way that we used here to add values to the elements of the array and let me just copy this and I'm storing also a couple other elements in the array, so I'm storing there another programming language like Java and C Sharp, since this is a C Sharp tutorial. And I'm still using this for each loop to loop through the elements of the list as well, so I'm just going to need to modify it here. So language, the name of the variable in languages, so we're looping through each element of the list and we'll print out to the console each, sp each element of our list okay this is my typing error okay let me run the program and we should see here python java and c sharp there are many different built-in methods that we can use to store to manipulate or to access are elements of the list and let me just show you a couple of those so if we write the name of the list again dot here we see a whole list of built-in methods that we can use to access or to manipulate to do something some specific operation to our items of our list and let me just show you how the remove method works so basically here we can specify the name or the value of the item that we want to delete from the list so let's say we want to remove the java from our languages list and if we print out if i run the program now when we print out the elements of the list to the console we see only python and c sharp let me just comment this out for the moment and we also have a method which is the insert method which allows us to input a specific element at a specific position at the list let's say we want to input in the first in the element with the index of one some specific element and let's say for example sql another language so here the SQL language will be put into the second item of our list here momentarily we have Java written there but let's see what happens when we run the application we'll see that SQL now is in the second position or in the position with the index of one in our list and then Java is pushed through the third position and C sharp is pushed into the last position of our list there are many many more methods that we can use to play around with lists let me just comment this out again and we have a method that basically the sort method that basically just sorts the elements of our list al alphabetically let's see what we'll have here we have here c sharp because it begins with a c then java then python some other useful methods that you could use while coding let's say we have the count method which basically just counts the number of items that the list has maybe here we can see that our list has only three items but in a larger list or in a list that maybe is written in another file if we want to access the number 
of the items that this list has, we can just write this count method and so that we can see it printed out. Let me just write the write line method. And we see here three printed out. So we have three elements in this array. We can actually also see the index of, of a specific uh, element of the array, let's say. So if we would want to know in which index is the element with the value Java, let's say, or let's say C sharp, by just writing this index of method, we will see that we will see printed out of the console that uh, C sharp is placed in the index of two, so in the third position, basically. So this were lists in C sharp. As we saw, the main difference between a list and an array is that lists can grow or shrink in size, and we saw a few methods that we can use to work with lists. A dictionary is a data structure that allows you to store and retrieve values based on unique keys. This concept can be compared to a real-world dictionary. So consider the dictionary of the English language. Each word in the English language serves as a unique key. Keys are used to look up the definitions of words. And the definitions of the words are the values associated with the keys. When you look up a word, you get its corresponding definition. This is basically how the dictionaries work in C Sharp as well. You can use various data types as keys and values, depending on your specific requirements. So let's just start by creating a dictionary. Firstly, to create the dictionary, we need the dictionary keyword. And then inside this angle brackets here, we need to specify the data type of our key and of our value for the key value pairs that the dictionary will contain. So here I'm just making a dictionary of like an English language dictionary. So I'm gonna need to have a string for the key, which would be the word, and also a string for the value, which will basically be the definition of the word. So I'm gonna need to write two strings here. Then I'm just giving a name to the dictionary, like English dictionary then i'm just going to write the equal sign here new dictionary then again i'm going to need to specify the data type of the key and of the value then at the end just a parenthesis here and the semicolon so this here is the syntax of how you can create a, dic a dictionary in c sharp so to add a key value pairs to our dictionary, we're gonna do this by using the add method. So basically I'm just gonna need to have here the name of the dictionary, dot add, and this method here accepts two arguments, one for the key and one for the value, which are both strings in our case. The first one, let me just say, we want to see the definition of C sharp in our dictionary and the definition will be a programming language so let's just keep it simple and this is the key this is the value and this is the first key value pair that the dictionary has now let me just add another one down below so let's say we want a definition for a computer Let's say a computer is a electronic device. Let's leave it like that. And there are different ways of how we can actually print this, the values of the key value pairs of our dictionary out in the console. But I'm just using a for each loop here. So I'm looping through each, each key value pair. I'm gonna need firstly a variable to loop through the dictionary. I name it dict. So this VAR keyword here basically is an anonymous data type, which basically means that the compiler will just figure out itself the data type 
that this variable takes. So we can use this for the dictionary and we'll look through our English dictionary here. And I'm just using the console letter right line method. And actually, if I would want to, to print out to the console only the keys or only the values of our dictionary, I could just write here dict that key. Let me just run the program. And we'll see here that we have only the keys of our key value pairs, so the C sharp and computer. And the same way would work also if we wanted to print out only the values. As we can see here, a programming language and a electronic device. But there's a way for us to print out uh, more than one value with this console.writeLine method in one line. And let me just show it to you. So firstly, I'm going to need a string. Here, uh, double quotation marks. Inside here, I'm going to need two sets of curly braces. In the first set, I'm going to write the index of zero. And in the second one, the index of one. And I'm just going to explain to you in a bit what this does. Afterwards, I'm just going to need to write here dict that key, comma, dict that value. So uh, what these curly braces with the index of zero represent, they represent the value of the first argument after the comma here. So the value of a dictionary that key will be uh, put here, will be represented by these curly braces here. And the second set of curly braces will represent the second argument after the comma here, which is the value of the key value pairs. So if I run the program here, we should see C sharp, a programming language, and then computer, a electronic device. There is also another way for us to access elements, uh, key value pairs of our dictionary. And let me just show it to you. So I'm using the console.rightline method. And to access, for example, a val the value of our dictionary, a specific value, I'm just going to need to write the name of the dictionary here. And then inside square brackets, I'm going to need to write the name of the key, which is, let's say, C sharp. And here, this is another way how we can access values of our dictionary. Let me just comment this out for a second. Run the program. We should see here the value of with the key C sharp. And I'm just going to comment this out here. We're going to use the for each loop for the next ex examples. So if I, if I just write here the name of the dictionary and then that we see here a whole list of methods that we can use to work with dictionaries. I'm just going to show you a couple of those. So the remove method for example, takes one argument, which is the key of a key value pair of our dictionary, and then it removes that key value pair. Let's say we want to remove this computer, uh, the key value pair where the key is computer. And if I run the program here, we should see that we only have this one key value pair now. The second value pair that we wrote here is now removed. Let me just comment this out as well. And there's also another method I want to show you, which is contains. So by just adding the name of the dictionary, there we, then we have here two methods, contains key and contains value. And this method basically just, just returns true or false. And with this, we can just check if our dictionary contains a specific key with this method or a specific value with this method. Let me just use the second one. So let's say if our dictionary contains this, this value, this should return true. But for us to see it in the console, I'm going to need to write console the console.writeLine method. So let me just run the program again. 
and we see here true since this value is in this key value pair here. Until now, in this C-sharp series, we have stored data in variables or in a data structure like lists or arrays. And as soon as our program closes, this data is lost. A way to solve this problem is by storing our data in a file so that all of our information will be saved even after we close the program. In this video, we will see how we can work with files, how we can write and read data from them, so just keep on watching. So here I have just opened up a console application project in Visual Studio. Here I have a program class and then a normal standard main method. What I'm going to do firstly to before we create the file and store text into it, I'm just going to take input from the user. So first I'm just going to print a message in the console to let's give a message to the user. Let's say let's say enter a name. And then just underneath, I'm going to use the console.readLine method to take the user's input. And I'm actually going to store this input in a variable, in a string variable. I'm just naming it input here. And what I'm going to do then after we write a text in our console, after we write a name, and we're just going to use the file class that write all text method. So this is the method that we're going to use. What this method does is that it creates a file and inputs a string that we specify into it and then it closes the file. If the file already exists, this method just overrides the content of that file with the string that we specify here. So this method takes two arguments. The first argument is the name of the file. Let's say new file. If this file does not exist, this method will create it. And I'm going to make it new file.txt, so a text file. The second argument will take a string. So here I'm going to give the input that we created above. So if I run the program here, Firstly, we should see a prompt to enter a name. Here we see the console, enter name. I'm just going to use some name here, like Matthew, click on enter. And that's it for now. So we should actually try to find this file if it was created or not. This file will actually be created in the directory where this project that we're working on is saved. So to find it faster, I'm just going to input the name of the file in the search bar here, .txt. Here we see this file and the location of the file where it's in the same directory where our console application project is saved. So I'll just click on it to open it up. And we should actually see the new file here and the name Matthew printed into it. So if we would actually just run the program again so that we'll see how this method works, let me just do it here. If I enter another name like John in this file, if I open up the file again, so it was this new file document, we see John, so the first name that we wrote was overwritten, and that's how actually this method works. Each time we run the application, each time this method works, it overrides the file with the content that it already has. But what, how we could process in this case if we would want to just add a name after another name? Actually, in those cases, we are going to need to add to use another method, which is the method append all text. So append all text. So this method, what it basically does, we could have used this method since the beginning. If the file does not exist, it creates the file. And if it does, it just appends the input that we give to this file one after another. So that the names that we input, the text that we input into the file are not printed just 
one attached to the, to the other one. We can just add a new line after each input. So for this reason, I'm just going to use this, the string interpolation here. So I'm just going to use the double quotation marks in the beginning. In the end, we need this dollar sign here. And after we take the input, I'm just going to need to write slash here and for a new line. Let's just run the program and see how this works. So let me just add another name like, I don't know, something with Z. So Z. I'll run the program again and I'm going to input another name like Aaron run the program here and then just find the file just again here what we see here we see that z was inputted after john but without a space and then aaron was saved in a new line this happened actually because firstly when we created when we used the write all text method when we made the input here we didn't enter a new line at the end. That's why Z is just attached to John. We could actually just could have used this since the beginning, for, but for me to make it faster, I'm just gonna input the new line manually here and save the file. Or we could have used this in the beginning when we created the file. So as we saw here, we saw two methods to write text into a file. Now we're going to see another method of the file class to actually read the content of the file. This method is called read all text and it takes one argument. It takes the name of the file which is new file. So it reads the content of the file and then closes the file. That's what this method does. So for us to actually see the output of this file, I'm going to need to use the console.writeLine method. And for us to not add any other name to, to our program, I'm just going to comment these lines out. So if I run the program here, let me just see it. We see only all of the elements all of the text that our file has. We see John, Seth, and Aaron. So actually a practice when we read, we read specific data from a file, it is a good practice, it's a common practice that we, if we want, for example, to modify the content of our file or to make sure that the file is structured in a, sim in a specific way, we actually get the data from the file, we store them in a data structure, let's say a list, we make the modification or the for format that we want the data to, to be presented. And that's the example I'm going to make right now. So actually, I'm just going to create a simple list here, a list of strings. So I'm naming it just list since it was already pre-made here. New list, a list of strings. And this is the way we declare a list. So I'm just going to comment this line out for now. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to need the for each loop to loop each every line of our file. So for each, let's say, line in file that read all lines. So I'm going to use this method right now, which just reads through all of the lines of our text file. this. So basically what this does is that it reads through every line of our file. I'm just going to need to specify, it takes an argument, I'm going to specify the file name which was new file.txt and each line of our file I'm just going to add to our list that we created. So I'm writing here list.add and then a line. So in this point here, we have added all of our all of the lines in this list that we created here. And down below, we can actually do what we want to the list. Let's say we want to 
list the items we want to sort the items that the list has so we're using this sort method here it just sorts the items that the list has alphabetically so they should be listed out in an alphabetical order so after doing this and can also just use a for each loop again to just print each item of the list in the console so for each item in list I'm just going to print each item out of the console. Let me run the program. We should see Aaron in the first place, then John, and then Zed. Exceptions in C Sharp, like in any other programming language, refer to problems or errors in your code. Exceptions are a mechanism used to handle runtime errors or exceptional conditions that may occur during the execution of the program. When an error occurs, an exception is thrown and if the exception is not handled, the program terminates and an error message is displayed. And in this video, we're gonna see what we can use in C Sharp to handle these exceptions. While coding different projects, it is very common for us to make different kind of mistakes. One of the most common mistakes or errors that we do while coding are these syntax errors. In this simple line of code here, if I, for example, forget to close the line with a semicolon and I try to run the program, the program would not allow me to because as we can see here, we see the error which, exp which basically says that a semicolon is expected there. But errors may happen also when the program is running. When a user is using a program, an error occurs and then the user may just get this long text of errors, of cryptic error, and the program would stop. And this is actually a case that we need to handle and we need to prevent this from happening. Uh, this is what we'll basically see in this video. I'm just gonna leave this line of code here as it is and underneath I'm just gonna make our program so that it takes input or a number from the user and I'm actually gonna store it in an integer variable. I'm naming it number and I'm gonna use the console.readLine method here but as we've seen also before this method just takes a string for us to convert what we take from this method into an integer I'm just gonna use the convert to int32 method convert and I'm the, underneath I'm just gonna also print this variable to the console. Let me just run the program firstly and we see the prompt here enter number if I enter a correct number let's say 45 45 will be printed out and the program ends but if I try again to enter let's say a string which is basically just a sequence of text we will see this long cryptic message here we can understand it here that the input string is not in the correct format but this shouldn't happen to a user this kind of error and this kind of message shouldn't be in this way and there is a way for us to actually manage this in C sharp in C sharp we use the try and catch blocks so basically for each part of code, each piece of code where we think that an error may occur, we actually put this code inside a try block. Let me just input all of this code here. And after the try block, we can write multiple catch blocks. So what the catch blocks do is they actually detect exceptions and let us do something specific after detecting this exception. There are different kinds of exceptions that we can catch with this uh, catch blocks and we can actually specify the exceptions that we are looking for. Let's say I'm looking for a format exception. We can see if that's why the error occurred. I'm just giving a name to the variable like e and each time this kind of error happens we want to print something out of the console 
we could just print a custom message here but I can also just print out just use this e variable here and use this message method with which just basically prints out the message of the error not all of these lines of all of the scripted lines but basically the main uh, message that the error has and let me just shine around the code again So in this case, this try block here, the program, when it goes to the try block, it checks for an exception and then it goes to this catch block. So let me just write a piece of text again. We will see this message printed out to the console, which is the input string is not in the correct format. And as I said, after the program reads the try block here, and it tries to get an integer from the user, an error occurs, and that's why the program goes to this sketch block. It sees that this is a format exception, and for this reason, this message will be printed out. But even though the text is more understandable and it's shorter, still that's not a good user interface, or it's not a good uh, implementation of the program because the user may just make a mistake just a typing mistake and we would want for the user to try and input again the right data so what we can do in this case is actually just put this whole try and catch block inside the while loop so that the user will try and input the correct uh, the data until it is the data that is required from the program so i'm just making the condition here true so the while loop will run as long as we break out of the loop, as, we, as long as we decide to break out of the loop. So I'm just cutting this code and put it inside this while loop. And we want for the program to actually break out of the loop if this input here is correct. So after the program reads this line here, then it takes the input from the user. If the input is is not an integer then the program goes to this catch block and then the while loop runs again the prompt will, will ask the user again to input a number and if the the number inputted by the user is an integer actually we want to break out of the loop in this part here so that the user won't be asked again to to input a number let us just try the program here enter a number if i enter a correct number we just see the number is printed out here and the program breaks out of the loop but if i enter a string again we'll see the error message here that's printed out the input is not in the correct format and then the user is asked again to input a number if i run if i input a text again we will be still asked to input a number and if I write a number then the number is printed out and the program basically ends. We can write as many catch blocks here as we want. Just the logic behind it is that the program just reads, just reads the catch blocks from top to bottom and if one catch block has the actual exception then the program just executes the one catch block and the other ones won't be executed or will be ignored even if they are valid as well. So for this reason, we just the logic behind this is that we want to write the most specific cases or the most specific exceptions on top. And then on the bottom, let's say we want to write like a specific, a general exception, which is done by this exception keyword here. So this sketch block here is just a general exception, which basically gives us a general error message. Sometimes the error message is correct, but sometimes this block does not print out the specific error that occurs in the case. For this reason, this is like more mostly recommended to be inputted at the end. And I can actually just, let's say we want to have um, another exception like another kind is divide by zero exception we just catch these exceptions where division is done by zero in this case this will basically not happen actually but let me just do something here let us just print out to the console 
let's say 4 divided by the number and let me run the program I will enter number if I enter 4 the result is 1 but if I enter 0 we see this error message attempted to, to divide by 0 so the program firstly uh, checks the first catch block it's not a format ac exception and then it checks the second block of catch the exception actually happened because it was a division by zero so the message is printed out to the console and the program just runs the loop from the beginning in, in the case when let's say the exception was not a format exception or division by zero then the program would run the last block of code so in our case here if i enter the correct number we should see that 4 divided by 47 it's 0. The last thing for this video is that you can also write an, another block of code in this try and catch blocks. The finally block. So the finally block is the block that is executed in, in all cases. So even if the program catches an exception this block of code here will be executed and even in the cases when the program won't catch an exception. So normally this block of code is used for example in those cases when we want to reset a variable or uh, when some files are opened we want to uh, close a file but in our case I'm just printing out like a custom message let's say block of code ended. If I run the program here let me input correct number we see firstly the result here and then the block of code ended if I run the program again I'm inputting a text we see the error message then we see again this block of code the message in the finally block here getting printed out so the block of code ended and we are asked to input a number again this brings us to the end of this series. Now you have learned all the main C-sharp concepts and topics to be able to start learning how to make real-life projects. I would highly recommend that you now keep watching the ASP.NET Core MVC tutorials that I will link in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate your time, I hope you got value from this video and I will see you in the next one.